Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because I have Lou Carter on the show today. And Lou is really going to give us some good perspectives on how we can make a connection in a, from, a, from an organizational perspective that's really going to assist in our performance and help us link all that together. Because oftentimes when we start talking about culture and things like that, we often don't see how we can actually make it happen uh, and how to get those high performance impacts that we want. Lou Carter was born and raised in Waterford, Connecticut, a small suburb of New London, Connecticut, an even smaller city of southeastern Connecticut. He has one sister, and his parents were divorced at age 20. But in his freshman year at Brown University, Lou's best, Lou's best friend actually committed suicide, and it was this experience that changed him forever. And he vouched that he never wanted another friend or person to have the same fate as his friend. And as a way to begin this process, Lou transferred to Connecticut College to focus on his longtime studies of economics and government with a focus on social systems and how governments form, and affect organizational systems and economies. Lou was always involved as the president of his class and founder of new organizations on campus at school that fought for the rights of students to be heard, respected, and understood. When he was hired by the president of the college, Claire Gaudini, to lead a professorship development program, he knew he could make a significant change. In the program, he focused on helping professors respect differences as well as create and drive a positive vision for the future. His first job out of college in his early career, he worked at Gemini Consulting, which is now owned by Ernst & Young, as a strategic analyst. He quickly found out that this was not bringing him closer to his purpose of helping leaders understand their immense power to influence the lives of thousands of people for the better. From there, he became a product development specialist at Linkage, Inc., where he became a product development specialist and later became their VP of research. It was here that he worked with the leading industry experts to bring their work to life, including the late Warren Bennis, Richard Beckard, and the luminaries, Edgar Schein, Marshall Goldsmith, John Cotter, and Chris Argus. He created one of the first global leadership development competency programs, and he was able to work with leaders like Benjamin Netanyahu, Senator George Mitchell, Benzir Bhutto, Hunter Patch Adams, and others who fought for the rights of their people with grace, compassion, and respect. This inspired him to write the best practice book series for John Wiley and Sons, which included all of the best-in-class leadership development, learning, and talent management programs and practices from around the world with blue chip and Fortune 500 companies like Pfizer, Volvo, Boeing, Corning, Allstate, GlaxoSmithKline, Bose, Motorola, BP, Colgate, Microsoft, the IRS, and hundreds more. It was his lifelong purpose to help others create a culture of respect and positive vision of the future that brought him to write his most recent book, In Great Company, How to Spark Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Culture. Lou is a family man and spends much of his time possible with his family, and they are an integral part of his life and he considers them to be his most important legacy. In Lou's opinion, there's no greater purpose or legacy in life than family and the supporting system you build around them. Community, coaches, teachers, and extended network that develops them to become the very best in life. Lou Carter, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I love that. Hey, hey, Jim, it's awesome to be here today, and thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that awesome introduction, too. It, it, thank you. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity and being here on the show. And now I've given my legion a little bit about you, but can you share what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Sure. You know, my current passion is working with uh, organizations, especially healthcare uh, clinics, and really helping them to uh, to grow and uh, come from sort of here to there, right? Uh, because healthcare clinics and health uh, right now today, they are in a very challenging position because patients are coming back. 
and they, there's uh, elective surgeries that people aren't, don't feel that comfortable doing. And uh, there's also COVID and pandemic that they're dealing with. And we have to look ahead. So it's the healthcare clinics that are creating those external collaborations and the leaders at the top who are really doing extraordinary things to get those clinics back up and running. So my, my passion is working with those, the CEO, CFO, CEO, I just love it. I, and their board and bringing them to a place where they can create awesome practices to serve patients to their best possible level. Well, needless to say, that's a very important mission that you currently are undertaking. And for me, when I started actually going through the book, I didn't have that context. So thanks to you for sharing. And I think that brings things um, on a very, very different light. Um, because oftentimes we have a separation, especially in those environments, you know, because we have the pressures of all the finance elements, you know, with the caring elements. And that, that, that oftentimes, you know, creates a whole lot of friction that we don't want to have. But you talk about four very important benefits of emotional connectedness, and they are that it fulfills intrinsic needs, it makes emotional intelligence more actionable, it creates psychological safety, uh, and it drives discretionary effort. Now, how did you come up with these four? Yeah, so we, we did a survey and a bunch of primary interviews, a bunch of surveys, and ask people, what is it that's going to make you love your workplace and do even more? That's the voluntary discretionary effort. And then the psychological safety came in because they said, well, how am I going to create more? Well, I feel safe talking and want it so that I'm not harmed or I lose my position if I don't, if I don't, uh, if I say the wrong things. And it wasn't just about psychological safety. It's that intrinsic reward system. That's intrinsically what will drive me to do these things. And what we found that drives people to do things has more to do with practices and behaviors, things that you do and others do around you that enable you to really just skyrocket. And in the absence of these behaviors, it, can't, it doesn't matter how great of an accountant you are or how great of a technology technologist you are or a strategist, it just doesn't matter. If you don't have them, uh, your team suffers, your organization suffers. Well, and you, and to give it justice, I mean, in the book, you actually break down all of these particular elements, these four now benefits, and you go into that detail uh, to, to a greater degree. But here's the thing that I find quite interesting in what you shared, though, is the whole, whole self-reporting element of, you know, what I feel and, and even if why I feel it. So how do you actually prevent people just saying things that they may think is the right thing to say with it actually connecting with them as an individual? Hmm. So a lot of people have, they have two responses or two ways of thinking. Some are physical thinkers and others are more cognitive focused and they actually have to think through things before they say them. So physical thinkers just immediately blurt things out and they're reactive. And uh, this kind of self-reflection, this uh, ref self-reflection, self-awareness of how they're talking and how it has an effect on others is an enormously, incredibly important competency to have to be emotionally connected because it allows us to take a, a breather, a meditative step to download information. And there's known to be terabytes of information that comes into your brain all at once when you hear information terabytes. You think about that. There's no longer gigabytes. There's, there's terabytes. And the question is now, how do we do, how do we take that information and then give it to you, give it to others that are, that are hearing us in a simple way? So we don't, we're not just reactive thinkers. We're thinkers who can take a tremendous amount of data and provide it back in a simple way that other people can receive it just so that it's not so harmful or, or, or hurtful even. Well, it's really interesting that you say that um, because for me, I'm, I'm like, okay, you're data driven, right? You're all about analytics and understanding the analytics and being able to use them in order to be able to affect these drivers, right? Um, be able to go in and modify certain behaviors. I mean, all of those types of things. So what I was referring to and your response wasn't what I was necessarily looking for. So that's why I'm asking this a different way. And I appreciate you allowing me to do that is I'm asking somebody these things in regards to what would fulfill your interest. I mean, all of those things. And, and for us as individuals, a lot of times we can't necessarily, you know, know why, right? We, we don't understand that. So how do you make sure that your data isn't tainted 
because, and start doing something that really isn't going to have impact. You know, so, so we have something called the ladder of inference. So, uh, and, and uh, where you in the middle, in the sort of the bottom of the ladder is, is data, it's raw data, it's things that we hear, it could be anything, this is why I'm here, or, you know, I'm saying something to us, and it's things that we just automatically take, and it just, it's that thousand people in their own mental models can take it different ways, and you walk up the ladder, and you suddenly you get to environment, right? That's some of the things that you believe in, so environment, will, and you've been talking about, and, and judge and start to come to the judgment portion. It gets to you know how you grow up and what are what are the things that uh, affect your perceptions and um, and your experiences and um, those kinds of things have impact and often they're triggers. So these are triggers that you've had from inside of your life that can trigger a response in your mind. And to calm that response is very important because they affect your judgment, which affects your actions. And one of my good friends, Frances Hesselbein, once uh, I was at a meeting with her, she's the former CEO of Girl Scouts of America. She came up to me. I don't know why she did this, but I was sitting there at the meeting and she says, be careful of what you think because they'll affect what you say. Be careful of what you say because they'll affect what you do. And she came and she's, she's 102 years old, by the way. <laughs> so, and she said it right in my ear and, my, and I, I went like that. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, she's talking about the letter of inference. And so I, I put it in the book and it affected me. It, 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 uh, it touched me because I now think that when I have experiences, when something I say, well, maybe this is triggering me. Maybe I need to think of it in a different way. Maybe I need to expose or open myself to new, to new things. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay. So then what we're, what you're talking about is, but by having those four benefits, it actually results in five elements that spark uh, peak performance, and, and it's an acronym. So it's systematic collaboration, positive future, alignment of values, respect, and killer achievement. And so, again, I have to say that this is probably evidence-based, right? It, it is evidence-based, exactly. And, and one of the things that it, it came from, it was sparked from, was an experiment by Arthur Ahrens uh, back, back a long while ago, I think it was the 60s or 70s. It was called the Love Experiment. And uh, the Love Experiment was when two people come together and they basically look at each other. Not too long, after three minutes, it starts to get kind of freaky. Uh, but uh, for, the, for about three or four minutes, really. And then they ask each other a series of questions. And those questions largely have to do with these five areas that came up in the survey uh, when we asked what's going to make you feel really comfortable and want to produce even more for your company. So this, these questions, these five areas are very much attributed to work, attributed to life, are attributed to any environment that you're in. I can go through them and explain them for you. Most definitely. So, so I'll start it out. The first part of it is systemic collaboration. And in our lives, we have a family, we have extended family, we have coaches, we have people all around us. And that's part of our system. And how we collaborate with them and we listen and we give and we form alliances and structures and we're very honest and open about what things are and being also generous with our humor or even if we if we need to in, in a way and and being kind of just uh, there for people on a on a on a personal level and resonate with them is all is part of systemic collaboration. So if you approach that for your company too, it's the same, right? So if you're CEO of a company, you form relationships with other, uh, perhaps even competitors, people who could, uh, who you can help to get even to a higher level because of the reality that they need to, uh, they need to come to terms with, or they should come to terms with, and that often happens. Um, and also for people who are part of the extension, uh, extension inside of the government or local, all these relationships that happen in, in, inside the company, how does the board work with the executive team, the executive team with the different divisions, all the way down to the magic middle of the company and to the, and to the customers themselves. So these, this is the system. This is how we collaborate. And the number one way you collaborate systemically in our in our world of in great company emotional connectedness is co-creation. Co-creation means that you have a vision. 
And that's the second part is, is positive uh, future. You have that positive future, that vision for what you want to create inside of your organization or inside your family or your life. And that is very clear. You present it, you create it with others through inquiry, questions, and advocacy, advocating what you want your future to be, what that inner diamond is really of what that future should be. And that becomes what you create within your system and and your strategy for your system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We can go through the five and I can explain it a little more. Um, so if you if you look at that that inner diamond, that kind of where you're at, what your vision is, think of an example. I'll give a case for it. Huberger Lee is the CEO of Best. He was the CEO of Best Buy. He was brought in by Jim Citron from Spencer Stewart, who is a CEO executive search consultant. And Jim looks for one thing when he brings in new CEOs: vision. If you have a really strong, compelling vision that will bring the company from here to where they want to go, which is essentially at Best Buy, they wanted to go from being a showcase to being profitable. Because at Best Buy, people were coming in, they looked like a showcase, a showroom. They were taking pictures and looking at barcodes, and then they were looking up on Amazon and other places and figuring out, oh, I don't really need these things or buy these things here. So Hubert said, I've got a vision for the board. And he said this, he said, I want to make you and everybody here a community. I want to I want to create a way for us to help our customers and for them to stay in the store as long as we can so they can make a possible purchase and not leave the store, find a better price, but be with us as a community. Created the Geek Squad, of course, and everybody knows, and the rest is history. They've been, become very successful and profitable as a result. Same is true of positive vision. When you have this positive vision, which is this P and the spark, you can move forward a lot better, and people all know where you're going and what you're all, what you're doing. Go to the A, right? <laughs> so uh, the alignment of values. So alignment of values is important because when people know your values, especially at the top, and they know what you respect and what your your boundaries are and what you want in life and what uh, and how you and what you know your strengths as well what your strengths are and areas you can improve on. So you can have self-awareness. People align with those values and the right people come as well. And it's easy to spot people who do not align with those values so that we can help them either develop those values as competencies, actual behaviors, or choose maybe it's not the right place for them. And that's okay. No guilt, no blame. It's always no guilt, no blame. We find places where we should be and we're where life is good for everyone. And I would say that you have to create a world of work where everyone wins. So that's alignment of values. My values align with your values. We find out a commonality in this, in a spark relationship in a spark conversation. It's always there, whether it be, this is something I share. This is something you share could come from our, our background could come something from your family, my family, something I've experienced, you've experienced that kind of commonality. Same thing for CEOs, same thing for really anyone in relationships. So the, the R is, is, a, is a fun one, uh, and I get a lot of uh, questions about it because there's so much controversy over respect, which is funny. It's, it's an enormous, it's like one of the biggest possible subjects. We're actually we're going to call the book Respect because uh, we had so much consternation and questioning about it. And here's why there, we've seen so much question about it, because people's definition of it is very different. So they say, well, I expect respect, right? And I have to have respect before they even give respect. And we found that respect is actually a currency, something you give and then get back of. And we also found it to be there's reciprocal as a system. You give it, you get it. Now, these, aren't, these aren't very, uh, you know, complex topics, right? Give respect, get respect. Here for years, been happening since the beginning of time during, you know, Machiavelli, eye for an eye, tooth, tooth for a tooth, right? Or in, in, in the history of time, it's has happened. What's different, though, about it is that we took the concept of friendship as being needed for engagement, which we don't, we're not, we're not about engagement in this book. We're about doing more and feeling more connected and actually creating peak performance. Friendship for engagement. It's not about friendship. It's about respect. An example is Jackie Robinson was 
greatest baseball player of all time. We know you're a coach too, so you, I, I believe he's one of the greatest baseball players of all time. When he was a, when he played baseball, people threw tomatoes at him. They booed him. They were disrespectful of him. And he started he started hitting that ball, making home runs, and he was one of the best baseball players of all time. You know what though? Jackie said to him, "I don't care if you're my friend. You have to respect me." And that's the one thing we talk about here is you respect me for who I am and what, I, and, and, and the fact that I work hard and the fact you, you don't have to go out with me for uh, drinks later or tea, whatever you drink, whatever liquid you drink there, just respect me and I'll go home and I'll live my life. So that's what respect means in a deep level uh, for individuals. A lot like Jackie was, I, I like to talk about Jackie in that way. Killer outcomes is really about how what we do as individuals and what we do as a company. We have to really connect these things. So as an individual, if I'm the head of accounting, I want to get my numbers in correctly and accurately. That's really it. So at the end of the day, if that doesn't happen, there's got to be reasons for it. Relationships, collaborations, not a clear vision, not an understanding of what my values are. All those things are off. Chances are that's why your numbers aren't coming in well. So that's that's really about outcomes is that it can be misaligned when all those other things are are uh, not aligned, right? So the uh, same with a COO or CEO, See, great C- COOs or have all the great competencies and CIOs and they have that clear vision and collaboration, their outcomes are going to be great. They're going to get do great demos. They're going to get they get the best possible uh, customer outcomes. Same with CEOs, great strategy, great vision, great financial outcomes. That's it, Spark. Well, and, and, you know, I think you said it several times, so we probably need to hone in on it. You talk about, you know, leading and being a leader in all this, and you talked about both individually and collectively. And you mentioned uh, about an emotionally connected leader. They actually have five different elements. Um, They have the systemic collaboration, um, the positive future, the alignment of values, the respect, uh, and then also killer achievement. And, and, you know, you mentioned in Spark some of these things, and some of these things, it creates that uh, or enables, you know, the Spark to occur, but, but they're all important, obviously, right? But when I start thinking about, hey, this one carries heavier weight, I think I know what the answer because you kind of talked about it a little bit, but which one is it and why? Yeah, it's funny. Like, I, I see it actually, we always said that they're variables that are all you know, equally weighted and we equally weighted them in the, in the way that we created the survey. So ideally or scientifically, they're supposed to be all equally weighted. (laughs) So, so it now, if you're going to ask me quality, like qualitative me, like which one I think is the most important, that's a lot different. So I, I definitely think it's the respect. And I think it's about that kind of that aspect of, you know, what are, what are, what are my values? Because it, it, it runs into everything, right? So the respect is necessary with collaboration, with co-creating. It's respect is important for values as well, for aligning our values, because we need to establish that in order to even get to the second line there. And then, you know, the, the, the alignment values, the positive vision of the future, we still got to get the respect to get there. And then the outcomes, right? So it's, it's really about internal respect, others respect, group respect, organizational respect, customer respect. It all comes down to that. And respect comes, it really is follow, usually follows, you know, love, appreciation, emotional connectedness. Because if I get that very baseline, I can start to formulate deeper deeper emotions, just like in a relationship. Okay, well, as you're talking, for me, I mean, there are several, you know, light, lights that were going off in regards to that. And, but before I get to that, um, you know, having worked for, an, working, worked for an academic for 15 years, you know, the whole multivariate analysis and being able to determine what are key drivers and all of that becomes important. So even if I have that equal weighting, you know, and I don't know if you, you maybe you answered it in a, in a non- uh, analytic way, but there had there had to be statistically significant, you know, significant impact, and and you're saying it's respect. I am. I really am saying it because if uh, if we want, we can get into the science of it, which is there's there's three things: it was, it was psychological safety, organizational citizenship behaviors, and something called effective commitment. And those are the three scientific concepts that people are interested in the psychology of it that really impacted it. Um, 
And if you look at those three concepts, there's one that really kind of blares out. Um, psychological safety, you do need respect for it. But the other one is effective commitment. And if you looked up affective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-C-E, effective, a V, a commitment by uh, two, two people called Meyer and Allen back in 1991, like, you know, we don't, people who we don't even know, most people don't know who these people are, but they made one of the most significant studies, I think, in, in the history of, of organization development. And they said that effective commitment is how do we feel when we're committed, right? So if we are effectively committed, it means we want to be there. It means we feel respected. We want to be there. We want to be at our peak performance. However, when we have normative, so it's a, it's a three-part model. It's effective is the kind of the best. You have normative and commit and continuance. Normative is is kind of kind of interesting. It, it's kind of a, a, a little bit. People of a psychiatric condition <laughs> use that as normative because it's the truth. It's like they're they're saying to themselves, they have kind of this ritual thing where it's like, if I'm not here, something bad will happen to me. That's what they're thinking. If I'm not here, something bad will happen to me. And that I this I have to keep the norm, the status quo, unless I harm myself, I'll something will be harmed. Then there's continuance, which is continuance is I have to because that's the only job I have. I have to continue here. So both are two are forced. And we talked about even I mean we talked before about my background, you know, what how people feel when they're forced, when they're coerced into a position. And I think, uh, you know, if we looked at, you know, just depression and we look at people who feel uh, out of control today, they don't feel like they have control of their lives. It's largely because they feel forced into something or that they have to be somewhere. And to achieve effective commitment, they have to have a community or even if it's three people and they don't go to other people, two people, it doesn't matter, that respect them. And if you, and then if you open up into a larger sort of community where respect isn't thought of continuously, or other things might be on their mind, they may be some other places on the ladder of inference, probably hundreds of places on the ladder of inference. Now we're in trouble. So the deeper you go into community and you start getting the help from either social help or other help from externals, the the less that that res that, that the, the more that respect flattens and lessens it can't happen. It's one of the most dangerous things for people that can happen today. It happens with vets. It happens with people who are who, who have severe depression and people who really need deep help. And um, caregivers, uh, people in organizations, leaders need to know the immense power they have. And um, in 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 other people's lives, I think that responsibility is quite massive. Um, but uh, and I think you know the whole high performance thing um, when you start looking at all of this and being able to create this. And you said it early on is you know you you talked about you know the customer and the customer experience and the high performance. So how tell us how all of this actually does impact the customer. So one of the first people I talked to in this book was uh, Amar Bose. He and he so the uh, and uh, Amar I knew him back for, uh, when I was at Linkage and um, so uh, and one of the things Bose really talks about is this feeling that a customer has with their I have one on this a Bose headset with their Bose headset they love it they feel an emotional connection to Bose people wonder why is this well. The design, the feeling, the values, it's everything. It's the respect for brand. It's the respect for excellence. Whether it's the best decibels and musical uh, audio experience in the world, I'm not sure. But something tells me it probably is. <laughs> I don't have, my ears aren't that trained. I've had swimmers here for about, you know, for a long time because I swim. <laughs> but I'm not, so I'm not really certain these are the best, but I love them. Some people don't know why. Right? I'm not sure why, but I love them. And uh, it seems like the best. So I think a lot of us uh, are like that. We go to certain brands. We use certain brands because there's an emotional connection to those brands. And the same thing really for why we choose to 
work for companies. There's an emotional brand for these big names, for Apple, for Google, for, you know, for Twitter, you know, we can all stay from home. They're massive brands. I really want to work for them. I have to work for them. Or even our institutions in our, in our United States and things we're working for the, the army, the Pentagon. Whoa, wow. I have, I have, I have further uh, clout <laughs> or something of that nature. These are things that define us and as a, as a, as an individual and then define us in, in who we are, who, what we buy, where we, where we work. And that's why the emotional connectedness comes in. It's hard to, it's really, it takes a lifetime to create that emotional brand. And, uh, and, and it, when you do it, um, it has to be done carefully, has to be done with a lot of investment. Um, and you'll see the biggest brands have the most investments behind them. I mean, that's a very, very key and important point. Um, but if, if I'm sitting there and I have a small work group, right? I'm in a contact center, I'm a supervisor, and I have a team of, you know, 10, 15 people. And gosh, now they've all been thrust into being remote, probably. Um, you know, how do, how do I actually create all of this emotional connectedness? And how do I even break through some of the, the fear and, and all of those, you know, insecurity issues and trust? I have, you know, I have trust now issues with all of humanity, right? I mean, I was talking to somebody earlier today, and they're like, you know, I've been stuck in my home in New York City for a long time. And she goes, and I hear all this stuff going outside. And she goes, I've never been this afraid in my own home. It's like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, that's it. So, I, so I've heard a lot of uh, ways that we can start to build trust with people. And one is the, your internal confidence, inner confidence. So there, one of, the resonance of our voice the way that we come through, the cadence, the belief in product, the connection you have to your product and your brand has to come first. All of that has to come from you. And if that doesn't come through, if people can't hear it right now, they're not going to believe you. You have to make things very simple for people right now. There is so much noise. There's so much noise out there. We have to knock out the noise and begin to say, this is all you need to do. This is the value. Be very distinct about the value and then help them through it. Help people. The hardest part of people both buying and being served today is helping. So being a servant leader, that leadership style is more important than ever. Serving people first, putting people first, helping people first, not and, and giving them your full attention and presence. That it will win every day, 100% every day. If you focus on that presence, that resonance, that value, and folk, really give your full self, I guarantee you'll win every day. Take it, it's a daily practice though. You have to ask yourself, did I do my best today to do that? And if you did not, do it again tomorrow and you'll do your best tomorrow. Every single day, that's what I'd say to contact centers. Well, I mean, being someone who is certified in emotional intelligence, I mean, your emotional intelligence is all wrapped up in your book and it's vitally important. And one of the things that's also important for us in order to be to, to connect emotionally that we use on the show are quotes. Is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? One of the things that, that I, I love about emotional intelligence in general is that EI, as you know, was built on two things. It, it, when you really, it, when you come down to it, emotional regulation and empathy. If you really broke it down, right? And what it, so if that if I were to say what emotional connectedness is, is emotional connectedness is emotional regulation, empathy, plus that added extra connection between individuals and the organization. So you're going beyond the EI. You're going beyond empathy and emotional regulation. So important, by the way. I, I believe it's one of the most important competencies possible to create psychological safety in the universe. Daniel Goleman and Ruben Baran were completely right in that, and they were so important in doing that. And they connected to neuroscience. And one day, as Elon Musk said, 
uh, in in a recent in a recent podcast, uh, uh, and Joe Rogan, he said we're going to have a chip in our brain, <laughs> literally in five years, that will create new neural networks for us to re- to become more regulated and more connected and more able to meditate to before making really important decisions. So you know this rewiring of of our universe <laughs> of people to be to create more emotionally intelligent emotionally regulated empathetic um, connected decisions is what we all really need so you didn't give me my quotes though lou do <laughs> you want a quote from my book yeah, you man. Want a quote from, okay well, quote from the book <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me get my book. Awesome response. And I, I, I don't know if I want a uh, borehole in my head to put in the probes that Elon Musk is talking about. However, isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it, you know, and I don't want to say never, especially with an Elon Musk. Um, gosh, I think he's on the route. He just put that. He just put that spaceship into orbit there, and he he's done incredible things with those Teslas, and now he's going to put a chip in our head. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> Who's going to be the first person? I like the neural, re-neural bundling. So yep. my favorite quote, I like this one. So uh, this is actually, okay, so this one was from my killer achievement chapter on page 182. And we're talking about failure parties that Intuit had, right? So they had they hosted failure parties. And P&G had it, has its you know heroic failure award. And, and uh, so it's it's the it's the courage to fail and learn from our failures, and so so uh, and uh, W L Gore is actually a neat one because um, they have one that says action is prized, ideas are encouraged, and making mistakes is viewed if you as part of the creative process. So that's a cool one. So the quote that I said because you wanted me to quote myself, right? <laughs> the quote I said is. For resilient organizations, the one rule they all adhere to is embracing failure to leverage the learning. Well, and talking about the embracing the failure thing, we we have to do that a lot um, uh, in in order to be able to move forward. We talk about getting over the hump on the show. Is there a time where you've gotten over the hump that you can share? Time I've gotten over the hump, it's probably been a lot of those times. (laughs) Uh, Let's think about time I've gotten over the hump. Well, I think if we're talking work life especially, I would say it was when I, I quit my first job. <laughs> I and I first, I quit it, and, and I I remember doing it because of you know and, and you know look I I have failure too in this because I had failure to communicate and formulate uh, deep relationships in that company. But uh, so I went in there. They're all Harvard people, right? So I was not a Harvard guy at the time. So they, they immediately excluded me. And uh, so they all went out to for drinks one night, and and uh, they locked me in the office to do their work <laughs> until three in the morning. I had a lot of work to do because it was everybody's work. So I went downstairs, and I wanted to. I opened, tried to open up the door. It was locked. And there was the alarm that was in my way. That was one of the humps in my way. So I didn't know the key. I didn't know the code. I didn't have a key. So I had to call up the owner. I said, Randy, I'm locked in the office. And I don't have the key or code. What do I do? Well, he was uh, a little bit too drunk to answer me. <laughs> and so I had to. I had to stay a while longer and the police had to help me out to bring me outside. <laughs> and I, I vouched at that time that I would never work for somebody like that again. So I was a little reactive, I think, in the moment. Instead of really making friends with those them, uh, I, so I went marched into his office and I went over the hump. I tell him how I felt and I left. That was the hump. And I, and I joined another company that was 
very respectful of me, gave me the opportunity to provide products to, and to them and create products with them. And they made me their VP of research within four years. And I flourished, had wonderful people there who were very kind and very, uh, really kind. And I made up all the greatest friends, they all from UNH. They were nice people. This one was younger, it was 25 years ago. All from UNH. Some reason I got along with people from people, with people from UNH and not Harvard. So go figure. Uh, they're very down to earth. And I like that. So that was the major hump in my life career wise. Well, but when I think about, you know, a lot of the things that you have going on and the work in the, from this book and you and I also have talked off my about some, you know, the, your, your family dynamic and, um, you know, the focus that you have there and the importance of that. And you even mentioned some of it in your bio, but you have a lot of things going on. But if I was to talk about one goal, you know, what is one goal you can share with us? The one goal that I, I've always wanted in, in my life is to, is to get a lake home. <laughs> I'll be totally honest with you. That's where I'm looking at. And I, I know many years I've said this. I've been boating since I was a kid, and I haven't had a boat for 25 years. And I've and I'm getting older now, and uh, so you know, family grow up and they'll they'll be you know another 10, 15, whatever it might be when they get older. Probably a good 10, 15 years. I want to have a lake house. I want to have a boat. So I kind I put together a plan for it, um, and about savings and about uh, how I can invest properly, and so I can make that in a 10 year time frame. And I'm very dedicated to it. So that really is my goal. Uh, and I can't give you anything about, I'm not going to give you anything like about, you know, saving world peace and uh, <laughs> like that. But I want to get a boat in the lake house. <laughs> that's the honest truth. Oh, that's good, man. And the fact <laughs> wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy to use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Home Day Hoedown. Okay, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show, Lou, where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Lou Carter, are you ready to hoedown? Right, I'm ready to hoedown. Get yeah, ready, Jim, ready. There you go. What is holding you back from being an even better leader today? You know, uh, it's probably uh, emotional regulation. Emotional regulation. I work on it every day. Yep. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, take it easy. Be cool. And what is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? Heart. Heart. No doubt. Heart and passion. Yep. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Relationships and accountability partners. Yeah. And what would be one book you could recommend to our Legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to Great Company on your <laughs> as well. <laughs> so everyone, if I can't say in Great Company or any of my other books. I can't say Change Champions Field Guide. I'll give, I'll give you one of my friends. I'll get you another book. So the book that I think everyone should read, and I think it's important for every leader to, to read, uh, because it, any, you, everybody, because it, and I'm going to say just why, just real quick, and I know it's this is the lightning round, uh, it, it is called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. I love it because it talks about the fact that we are already home and we don't need to venture out too much. We can do our work from home and stay focused on our goals here. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Lou Carter. Okay, Lou, this is my last hump day hood on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you could take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? Buy Apple. I would definitely buy Apple. I would buy real estate, more real estate. Um, I I, re, I would defi, I would my portfolio would be different at 25. I would uh, know about the subprime mortgage crisis, so I would begin to buy out in 2012. It would be it would be uh, literally 
I tell everybody right now, I mean, I don't, I'm not giving, I'm not an RIA. Um, I, I think right now is the most important time to focus on, you know, if I was telling my 25 year old self this, focus on your real estate, focus on your investments, um, focus on your 10 year plan. Because if you let that go, you know, 10 years, you, it's, you're just going to be focused on your career. Your career is important and finances, you gotta, you gotta balance that. Career is not enough. Job's not enough. Don't forget about yourself and the legacy you're providing to your family and, and to others. You can do a lot with it too. You can give it away to others to help them do things like philanthropy and it has so it just has so much possibilities. Lou, I had fun with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Can I, you can me, but you go on lewiscarter.com. My name's spelled L-O-U-I-S, Carter. And it's the French version, dot com. Come to see me there at bestpracticeinstitute.org, too. I own a company called Best Practice Institute. So check me out there. Or resultsbasedculture.com. It's another one. Throw all three. Lewis Carter, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 